Joining me now is CBSN political contributor and former communications director for Senator Marco Rubio, Alex Conan. He joins me now. Alex, I want to start with the Kushner story here. It's been the slow drip. How damaging is this for Kushner and the White House? Well, it's exactly what you said, a slow drip. That is the most damaging element to the story. For the life of me, I don't understand why the White House and Jared Kushner and his attorneys wouldn't make everything public weeks ago. They knew that the FBI, they knew that this, the Senate and the House committees are looking into these meetings and have questions about these meetings. And yet we're learning about this from the Washington Post on a Friday night rather than directly from the White House. And there's still so many unanswered questions about the nature of these meetings. Why weren't these meetings disclosed earlier? What, what was discussed specifically at the meetings? And, and why, if it's true that Jared wanted to set up a back channel between the, between the White House and the Kremlin, why would he want that? What is the purpose of that? So there's a lot of unanswered questions. And to answer your question, how damaging is this? It will depend on the answers to those questions. If they have good answers and they can get them out and we can be done with this uh, in relatively short order, I don't think it's a big deal. But if this continues to drag out and they don't have good answers for these questions, it will be a, it will continue to be a growing problem for the administration. You know, there are almost two dueling accounts. You've got the Washington Post account about this back secret channel, and then you've got the New York Times account that came out shortly after saying that this was all, uh, they were doing this to sort of move forward on how to deal with Syria. Do you buy the New York Times uh, take on this, that this is about Syria? Do you need a secret channel? for talks on Syria. I don't know why you would. I mean, look, there there is an established way for the White House to have direct secret or at least classified conversations with the Kremlin. For the life of me, I don't know why you would need to establish a back channel. And the way that the Washington Post described this as going to happen with Jared would go to the the embassy here, the Russian embassy here in Washington, it, it's laughable in, in the sense that nothing about that would be secret. Uh, you know, every every uh, intelligence agency in the U.S. monitors the Russian embassy here. We have a pretty good idea of who's coming and going from that facility. So it seems very ham-handed. It's a lot of questions at this moment, it, including why would he want to have a back channel to discuss Syria, something that our diplomats are fully capable of discussing directly with the Kremlin. You know, some people have said that Jared Kushner is just naive. He doesn't understand what intelligence, what goes around intelligence and how, how secretive and how, how uh, when you're dealing with classified information. But what I don't get, Alex, is the fact that according to these reports, we know that Michael Flynn was also there, a man with extensive experience in the world of intelligence. What do you make of that? Well, these are J Jared Flynn or Jared, Jared Kushner and Michael Flynn at the time, this is last December, were President elect Trump's top two advisors, top two national security advisors. Flynn does have a lot of experience in national security, but let's be frank, it's a mixed experience. He was fired by the Obama administration. And, and Jared Kushner has no direct foreign policy experience uh, other than, you know, doing real estate deals on an international level. So, Yes, you're right. It's possible that Kushner was naive in these meetings and, and making some of these suggestions, but that is not a very good excuse. Yeah, it's not an alibi when you're dealing with this type of uh, realm here. I want to ask you about the political communications of all of this. There's some talk about potentially a shakeup happening in the White House communication structure. You've dealt in politics, in communications. You know what it takes. How differently would, should, what advice would you have for the White House in dealing with this? Well, I've, I've got, I don't know if I have advice for the White House staff, but you're right, I do have a lot of experience with this. I worked in the Bush White House communications office, worked at the RNC as their press secretary, worked on a lot of presidential campaigns. And I can tell you the common thread between every press operation is you're only as good as the boss. You're only as good as the principal. You have to have a relationship where the principal, in this case, the president of the United States, trusts his press team and vice versa, that everyone is, speaks from the same script. Far too often in this administration, you see the press office and the spokesman and allies go out and say one thing, only to have the president go out and say something different the next day. So long as that happens, they will not be successful in pushing a message because they will because they will have no message. And so you're asking about a, you know a shakeup in the in the West Wing, bringing in some new communicators. I don't buy that any of that is going to be successful if Trump continues to tweet at will, if he continues to to, to tell people that his his spokespeople and his surrogates cannot be accurate all the time. Uh, and frankly, if he doesn't buy in on whatever the comms plan is of the day or the week and sticks to the message, 
as long as he keeps going off message, you can have the best communicators in the world working in the West Wing. They're going to continue to have a lot of problems. And that seems to be a style with his Twitter feed and, and going on his own way. I want to ask you about the G7 leaders. They released a statement today saying that they haven't released, they haven't reached an agreement with the U.S. on the Paris Accord climate change, what they're going to do going forward. The president said he's going to acknowledge exactly where the White House is going next week. What do you make of this? You're talking about the message that the president's putting forward might be different from what the communication team is putting forward. But what if the president pulls out of this agreement? What does that mean? Well, there's real internal dissent inside the White House over what to do about the, the Paris Accord. I think from a foreign policy perspective, there's very good reasons to stay in it. And then from an economic perspective, there's reasons to not stay in it. And you, and you have the conservatives and the moderates in the West Wing sort of disagreeing on it. And frankly, I don't think this is an issue that Donald Trump, the president, has thought a whole lot about over the years. And so I was surprised that their policy was not fully baked by today, that we still don't know whether or not he's going to stay in the Paris Accord. He's going to have to make a decision on one way or the other. Why he's dragging this out is unclear to me, other than they probably haven't made up their mind yet. Uh, but it sure would have been nice if they'd made it up by, by today. Instead, this is going to be what everyone is watching next week. What will the administration decide on this? And I can guarantee you, whether he stays in or whether he stays out, he's going to create some political headaches for himself. Speaking of political headaches, Alex, you know, de depending on where he goes on this, we know he chastised NATO allies and he didn't come down hard enough, according to some diplomats on Russia in this meeting. Where do you see this going? You know, how does this affect our relationships with foreign countries? Well, this to be determined. I think, you know, the, the world, just like everyone here in America, is watching this president very, very closely. He's very different than previous presidents that we've had uh, in the sense that he's very unpredictable. Uh, similarly, long-standing tenets of U.S. foreign policy, for instance, the respect for human rights around the world, the, advo the being a moral leader for the world, that is a role that Donald Trump does not seem to relish. And in fact, he went to the Middle East, he went to a country like Saudi, Saudi Arabia, where they, where they frequently violate people's human rights, uh, and said nothing about human rights, said that he wasn't going to lecture them. And then he went to our allies in Europe and lectured them about their defense budgets. Uh, so, you know, there's a little bit of inconsistency there, yeah. uh, which, you know I, know, I know a lot of people have pointed out in the last couple of days. Uh, look, I think Donald Trump, as Gary Cohn, his top economic advisor said, uh, is still sort of learning on the job. And, uh, and so people are going to continue to watch him closely. The world wants to have a good relationship with the United States. The G7 countries, for the most part, want the United States to lead uh, as we always have. Uh, so they're looking to Trump to see if he is willing to step up and provide that leadership. Speaking of leadership, uh, sort of dueling presidents, I want to get your take on President Obama being in Europe at the same time. He appeared with German Chancellor Angela Merkel. He's had a close relationship with her in contrast when you talk about Trump. What can we read into the decision that President Obama happened to be there at the same time that these meetings were taking place? I mean, I read that as, as Barack Obama just does not want to leave the world stage. He loved being president of the United States. He loved those big international uh, events. And, uh, and unlike George W. Bush, my old boss, uh, who after he left the White House, nobody really saw anything from him for quite a while. Uh, Barack Obama just doesn't want to go away, isn't going away, uh, and he's going to continue to pop up um, at times that um, that might be a little awkward for the Trump administration. But I will say it does look like Barack Obama is really enjoying yeah. his retirement <laughs> so far. I mean, the guy's doing it right. Alex Conant, thank you for joining us, Alex. Hey, thank you. Have a good day.